Why is it that we tend to wait for a crisis to change? It's really frustrating. I've spent the last 30 years in the water space, and for most of those 30 years, nobody cared. It was kind of a background situation. What has been very interesting is we're finally starting to see people pay attention, and some of that for right here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is because we're running out of water. But yet, our behaviors don't shift. And what I'm hoping is that we can get to the point where we don't have to have a severe crisis to change. It's interesting, back in 2007, Atlanta was facing a severe water shortage. Less than 60 days of water supply in Lake Lanier, the watershed for the city of Atlanta. A lot of concern, a lot of angst, people meeting, trying to figure out how do we change this. Uh, Governor Perdue led uh, prayer on the state house steps for rain, trying to pick change. Fortunately, rains came. Uh, and all was forgotten. Many of the projects that were set in place that would have made some long-term improvements to rebalance the supply and demand of water in Georgia are kind of on the back burner today. You look no further than, what, 10, 20 miles north of here just last week. It was a concern that a, a town very close to us right here is going to run out of water here in the, in the next couple of weeks. And yet, it still feels like these challenges are, are out of, our, out of our, our mind as long as we can turn on that faucet and get our water in the morning. So what I'm going to do is take you a little story of what's going on around the world and uh, globally but also locally and what we can do about it. You know, in Africa today, roughly 40 billion hours are spent every year hauling water and collecting this water. They don't have the benefits that we do. You know, by uh, 2025, about two-thirds of the world's population are going to be in an area of severe water stress. Today, about 1.1 billion people don't have access to clean water. And 1.8 million children die every year due to waterborne disease. Now, often it's masks and other diseases, so you may not realize that. But these are real issues that we have to deal with as a society. Where's the water going? This is Lake Mead. A uh, picture recently, Lake Mead's been down as much as 150 feet. It's you know, one of the largest reservoirs in the U.S., main water supply for the city of Las Vegas. We've got to address the challenges. Here's Las Vegas. Is watering the desert to create our next generation cities? Is that a smart idea? The way we distribute water today, the American Canal, you know, this, this fantastic supply of water to get from the Colorado River Basin to provide the water for the crops in California. Is this the best way to transport water? Is our infrastructure really set for the future? If you were to look at the total water demand around the world today, this is a gigantic uh, water tank in the sky. It's roughly 4,500 billion cubic meters of water that, that we use today. The challenge is that a few years ago, we reached a tipping point where we only have about 4,200 billion cubic meters of water available to us. So we already have this gap. That little orange bar represents that we're, we're eating into our, our reserve capacity. This is the decline of our reservoirs, the decline of our aquifers. This is the challenge we face. The problem is, fast forward 10 years, this is a $470 trillion uh, gallon gap in water. Obviously, this is unsustainable. We cannot continue down this path, so what in the heck can we do about it? Um, the way we use water today is divided into three basic areas. About 70% of our water today around the world is used for irrigation to provide the food that we need. That's for 7 billion people. What about 9 billion? Industry uses about 20% of the world's supply to provide all the stuff that we like, and about 10% is left for human consumption. So if we look at this a bit deeper, over the last century, the world's population tripled, our demand for water went up sixfold. By mid-century, there's going to be another 3 billion people on this planet. The challenge is that they're going to be in places that are already water scarce today and in severe uh, water situation. The basin of Los Angeles, available water there, supports about a million people. Problem is, there's going to be 22 million there in 10 years. Closer to home, El Paso, San Antonio, could run out of water in the next 10 to 20 years. Central Florida, less than five. So you say to yourself, ah, but I don't use much water. You know, I only drink a cup or two a day. I take a short shower. I brush my teeth with this floss faucet off. I have low flow toilets. Okay. But you may impact water more than you ever realize. Got up this morning, turn on that light switch. Do you realize that power is coming from a power plant, fossil power Fossil-fired and nuclear-fired power plants in the U.S. use about 50% of the industrial water in our country. Tremendous amount of water to make that energy and a tremendous amount of energy to make and transport that water around. If you look at where we are today, the energy demand represented by the lights around the world, by 2030, 
this demand is going to go up significantly. We're going to see a doubling of demand over the next 20 years, but that's going to require three times more water. Are we prepared for this future? Kids brush your teeth in the morning, you brush your teeth in the morning. We think all the things that we use that water for come from a local municipal drinking water plant. Do you know that 25% of that water coming in your house, what do you think it goes for? Whoosh, flushing those toilets. Single little laundry, 40 gallons. That shower you took this morning, 50 gallons of water. Brushing your teeth, four gallons of water. Good news there is turn the water off while you're brushing. You can drop that back to about a quart or so. We as humans need roughly 20 liters of water a day to live on, to, to provide all of our needs. The challenge is as you move around the world, you see more and more water being used. And this is one of those areas where the US doesn't necessarily want to be number one. Unfortunately, we are. We're the water hogs of the world. Roughly 380 liters per person per day is our water footprint, if you will, or 100 gallons a day per person. It's a lot of water. So we continue on through our day. We've turned the power on. We've used our water. Now we're getting dressed in the morning to know that that pair of jeans that you've got on this morning came from a factory in between all of the, uh, the processes, roughly 1,800 gallons of water to make our pair of pants, 400 gallons of water just to make a cotton t-shirt. We sat down to breakfast with our family this morning. That cereal you had this morning, the grain alone took 25 gallons of water to make one pound of grain. It takes 2,000 gallons of water to make one gallon of milk. And unfortunately, as a global society, we're shifting to meat-eating society, and that beef is 2,400 gallons of water to raise one pound of beef. These are, again, all challenges if we think about that, our continued growth in our population. So we turn on our electronic devices. We love these little babies. They're growing like crazy. That microchip that's inside everything we own anymore, it's roughly 10 gallons of water, of ultra-pure water to manufacture that chip. And there's millions of them being manufactured every day. That car you used to drive down here today, roughly 39,000 gallons of water to produce an automobile today. Of course, you've got to put gas in the car, and almost, on, on average, about 100 gallons of water is needed to, to produce that one gallon of gasoline. The buildings that we love to come to are, are large commercial properties. In, particularly in the southern United States, about 50% or better of the water coming to that property is used for outdoor irrigation. Do we need to be using fresh, potable water relatively inefficiently to grow our grass? Much better ways to approach these problems and, and become more efficient. So what can we do? There's a lot we can do. I just wanted to touch on a couple things that are being done that I would love to, to see if you can continue to help embrace some of these changes. The first thing is, I, I refer to it as source to use. Let's look at the right source water lined up with that right use. I used to, I've spent a lot of time in the industrial water market and used to go to you know, big manufacturing plants, power plants, and paper mills and all, and you see you know, giant hoses washing the floor with potable water. It just doesn't make any sense. So the idea is let's make sure we're using the right water for the right source. So across the top here, think about source water quality. You've got everything from seawater all the way to, to highly pure uh, well water. And across the bottom, a lot of different demands for this idea for food, for irrigation, water for industry, and water for lives, for human consumption. So today, what we typically do is we want as good a water as possible. We just use it everywhere. Well water, surface water, that's kind of what's got us into the problem that we face today. Instead, if we think about that, that available, replenishable supply of water on Earth, let's really focus that on our water for human consumption and think differently about some of these other things. Wastewater today, we typically use water once, we dump it out the back and forget about it. What a tremendous opportunity to reclaim, recycle, reuse that water just like we do an aluminum can or many other products. The technology is available today very affordably to treat that water and actually make it much better than potable water, but we have this yuck factor associated with that. We hear flush to brush, toilet to tap, shower to flower. Uh, the fact is that what a tremendous opportunity. The story is told that a uh, drop of water that flows down the Mississippi River from the north to the, to the Gulf passes through roughly 13 kidney, kidneys. So we're already drinking water reuse. I'd rather have it run through a membrane and purify it myself. But, so this wonderful opportunity to think differently about these other sources. Seawater, there's desalination technology. The price for desal has come down significantly, about 80% over the last 10 to 15 years. It's generally should be still thought of as a last resort. It's an expensive technology. It uses a lot of energy, but we've got that available to us, this wealth of seawater out there. So we can bring, sea, bring desal in, but let's, first look at how do we reduce consumption and, and uh, change our behaviors. So 
this whole idea of source to use, one idea. Second is fix the leaks. We've got 100-year-old-plus uh, infrastructure in the United States, and we are losing a tremendous amount of water, you know, represented by some of the, uh, the sites here. The uh, city of Chicago is a great example. They produce about 2 billion gallons of water a day in Chicago. Roughly 500 million of those gallons, 25% of that water, leaks to the pipes and never makes it to the end of the line. That's 500 million gallons of capacity that's available to be used in that, in that uh, city. And this same thing occurs around the country. The problem is we have been underpaying for water for so many years that there's no money in the bank to be able to pay for this infrastructure. So we're seeing rapid uh, water rate increases. Part of that is to be able to come back and fix these leaks and give us capacity. Third thing we can do is there's tremendous technologies that have been developed over the last 10 to 20 years. We can deploy these. We talk a lot about low flow toilets and the two gallon a minute shower head, those kind of things. Those are good, but they're gonna make a tiny dent. There's a lot more that we can be doing. A lot around irrigation. The company I'm with now does a tremendous amount. One of our, our offerings is to really reduce outdoor irrigation by 60 to 70% on these large commercial properties. Great opportunity there, but you know, it's really hard to get the people to embrace it. I don't get it. We have to wake up. There's technologies, reverse osmosis, ultrafiltration. A lot of these technologies are available that will purify water and enable us to take a low-grade water, such as produce water coming off of an oil field. Instead of injecting it into a deep well and getting rid of it, let's treat it and reuse it. That's water available to us. There's some really smart technologies to monitor what we're doing so we're aware. Just like we've been doing in energy for quite a while, we need to adopt those same technologies into the, the water space. And finally, there are things we can do with low flow appliances and other things in our homes. We have to continue down that path. I mentioned earlier this challenge of water pricing. And I just want to share with you, I've, I've, as I've traveled around the world and met with a number of uh, communities and countries, kind of track water price. And I looked at 183 different water price points around the world, graphed them out. So if you look at this graph on the, up the y-axis, this is the availability of uh, sustainable supplies of water. So think about it as rain. Dry on the bottom, going to very wet at the top. And if you go left to right across this chart, it's price point. So you go very cheap on the left, all the way expensive on the right. Logic would tell you that we should find a line something like this. The data should lay somewhere along this line where uh, if, if very wet area should be inexpensive, very high availability of water, to obviously if, if it's a very dry area, we should pay a lot more for that water. Supply and demand, right? The fact is, this is the way the data lays. There's this huge cluster in the bottom left corner, which means very water scarce area and water is essentially free. So how in the heck do you ever drive behavior change based on price point alone? Very difficult. In the Middle East, in a lot of areas around the country or around the world, incredibly water scarce, essentially paying nothing for that water. We've got to change this behavior. Another area is embracing some of these new sources of water. We don't have to use uh, fresh potable water for all of our sources. Rainwater, uh, as, as, as old as, uh, as any way of water collection, but there's some great new technologies to capture that rainwater. Roofs of parking decks, uh, you know, your yard, there's so many ways that we can capture rainwater and reuse that, and it's a great source of water. I mentioned desalination earlier. The price points have really come down on desal. It's a technology we have to embrace. And this whole idea of water reuse, tremendous opportunity to be able to use small scale plants close to, your, uh, close to a local community rather than big centralized plants. Great, great opportunity with these technologies. And then finally, just this whole concept of water stewardship. We've got to learn to conserve. We've got to teach our, our children and our children's children to continue to think differently about this, what we've considered to be a limitless supply of water. We've got to make water a priority. Even as these the headlines are out there where cities running out of water, it just drops back to a second or a third priority on a lot of people's uh, charts. We have to change that. It has to become an absolute priority. Don't wait for the crisis to occur. The, the other thing is there's a lot of expertise out here in the water space. Leverage those experts. Use them. Listen. Learn. There's this opportunity to understand true costs. One of the biggest challenges we have is that Water is relatively cheap, but we're not looking at all the underlying costs, the energy associated with moving and making and producing that water, the cost of property damage when either with too little water, we get a lot of change in the soil, or too much water, we end up with a lot of challenges. So there's a lot of issues around property damage. In fact, it's one of the top insurance claims, over $10 billion of insurance claims every year in the US of water damage, not related to weather, but water-related damage. It's a, it's a big deal. 
And bottom line is let's not wait for a crisis because we are running out of time. So I implore you to think about water, make it part of your daily, uh, daily thought process. If you have the ability to implement either in, in an industry or in a commercial building to make changes, listen and lead that change. Don't wait. Thank you.